All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Algebra and Keystone Practice Exam 2017. This is part one of a two-part video. In this part one, we're covering all the questions here in module one. If you want to see a specific question, fast forward to that question. If you want to see a question out of module two from this practice exam, go to part two of this video. Let's take a look at our first question. Four expressions are shown below. Which inequality comparing two, two of the expressions is true when 0.1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 0.4. All right, that means that x can be any value that is equal to or greater than 0.1 or less than or equal to 0.4. I'm going to just pick 0.1 as my value for x. So x equals 0.1. And I am going to substitute that into each of these expressions. And when I do that, I find out that I get 0.32 approximately. I get 0.01. All right, for this one here, I get 10. And for this one here, I get 0.05. All right, so what's true about these ones? Well, let's start to compare them. All right, in A, is the square root of x greater than x squared? Well, that means is 0.32 greater than 0.1? Well, yes, that's true. In fact, that is our answer right there. But whenever you get the answer for the very first question is A, please double check that the other ones do not make sense or are not true x squared is greater than x over 2. All right, is 0 0.1, that's basically asking, is 0 0.01 greater than 0 0.05? And that is not true. One, 0 0.01 is less than 0 0.05, so we know that one's out. All right, what about x? Well, x, we said, was 0 0.1. Is that greater than 1 over x, which is 10? Well, no, that's not true either. 10 is greater. All right, and then our last one is 0 0.1. 0, 0.05 greater than 10, and no, that is also false. So please double check to make sure that the other ones are not true, but in this case, A is the answer that we're looking for. Next question. The greatest common factor of x cubed y to the k and x 2k y to the fourth is x cubed y cubed. What is the value of k? All right. Well, remember our greatest common factor, one thing we've got to remember about factors, factors are fewer. That means they're gonna be taking the fewest that either has to offer when it comes to our variables, all right? So in this case here, if I look at x cubed yk versus x to the 2k y to the fourth, all right? I know that, y, I know that x cubed, this one right here, was taken as the fewest. That means 2k must be greater than 3. All right. I also know that y cubed was the fewest. Well, that means it was not this one right here. All right. The fourth was not taken. It must have been this here. And that means I know that k is equal to 3 in this case. And if I just verify that k is equal to 3 in the first one, I can plug it in. 2 times 3, well, that is 6, and 6 is indeed greater than 3. So it does work, and it makes it true. In this case, k needs to be 3. Which equation correctly shows that x squared to the fourth is indeed x to the eighth? Well, that means they're asking us to look at expanded form. What does expanded form mean? Don't even look at the options below. Just tell yourself what it means. We know x to the fourth tells us that it takes, or this group to the fourth tells us that there are four of these being multiplied together. And what's inside my group? Well, what's inside is x squared. Well, that means that it is x times 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 x. And we can see that that is indeed 8x is being multiplied together, which is why it is x to the eighth. And at that point, we can go down and we can look at which one of these shows that down below. Well, in this case here, d is the one that shows uh, the proper expansion of this exponential expression. Take a look at our next question. All right, when completely factor, uh, when factored completely, which is a factor of 6x cubed minus 12x squared minus 48x? All right, well, first thing we do when we come to factoring, don't even look at the options over there yet, pull out the GCF. Always start by pulling out the GCF. Look for the largest number and variable that goes into everything. Largest number that goes into all three of these is six. And they all have a common variable. X goes into all of them because they all have at least one X. 
When I pull out that 6x, it's no shock that x squared is remained because although that won't happen for every single polynomial as you move into the high school, but on the Keystone exam, they are saying that when you do factor things out, x squared is something that is gonna remain after changing a special case or pulling out a GCF. So in this case here, x squared is remaining there, uh, and we also have minus 2x, and we have minus 6 goes into 48 eight times and then we have that left over. Now, we want to factor what remains. We know that it's just x squared. This right here tells me two things. One, there's no GCF because of the constant. And two, we, well, we already pulled out the GCF. Uh, and two, it's a special case that each group is going to start with just x. And I just need the x of my dime problem where two numbers multiply to get negative eight, but add to get negative two. Negative product means it's going to be a negative and a positive. So they combine and make a difference of negative two, our larger number having two more negatives than the positives. And therefore it's going to be four times positive two, give me x minus four, x plus two. Which of these three factors is seen over here? All right, well, let's take a look. Uh, it happens to be my first one. A, that is the one that is seen over here at the side. Next question. This one is about determining a linear equation. Anna's Bakery charges a delivery fee of $10.95 for one delivery order of cupcakes. Each cupcake in the order costs $1.15. Which equation uh, describes the relationship between the number of cupcakes ordered and the total cost Y dollars of delivery? Don't even look at the options. Go straight to your formula sheet. You know Y equals MX plus B is the slope intercept form of an equation. Great for when we're given an initial fee and when we're given a rate, otherwise known as our slope, and you can plug those in, giving me 1.15x plus 10.95. That would be my linear equation, and let's check to see if that exists over here at the side, and it does, it happens to be C. Again, try to do this without looking at the multiple choice options first, and then identify the answer you came up with. All right, next question. All right, in this question here, we're looking at algebraic properties. Kylie and Rhoda are solving the equation four times the group x minus eight equals seven times the group x minus four. Kylie uses the first step that results in four x minus 32 equals seven x minus 28. However, Rhoda uses the first step that results in four x minus eight equals seven x minus four. All right, which statement is true about the first steps that Kylie and Rhoda, uh, sorry, what statement about the first steps Kylie and Rhoda use is true. All right, well, first off, you answer it yourself. Just look at what you should do and look at what they did. If I gave you this equation, the very first thing you would do is you would distribute. All right, using the distributive property, we would see that we should get four times X minus four times eight. All right, equals seven times X minus seven times four, which would result in what Kylie did right there, that is correct. What did Rhoda do? Well, Rhoda forgot to multiply the seven times the eight and four, all right, making those wrong, which is a common mistake that students often make. So let's read our statements below and see which one describes that. Kylie uses the associative property. Well, we know that's wrong, it's not associative property. I'll eliminate A and C as a result of that, all right? Kylie uses the, I'm looking at B now. Kylie uses the distributive property resulting in a correct first step. Yes, Kylie got it correct. So let's double check D, make sure D is wrong. Rhoda uses the distributive property. Well, she sort of used the distributive property, resulting in a correct, nope, not correct. She had an incorrect first step because she didn't really use the distributive property correctly. Next question. All right, this one's gonna be looking at verifying solutions. Darlene is collecting prize tickets. The equation y equals two x plus one describes the relationship between the number of days x since she began uh, collecting and the number of prize tickets y she has collected. All right, which statement correctly describes a solution to the equation? Darlene has collected two prize tickets. That means y is two here, all right, at the end of one day, days are x. All right, so basically, in this entire thing, they're asking us to plug in each of these values and see if it's true. And simply use your calculator, do y, whoops, sorry, I'm gonna actually put in my y value instead of just the number, uh, the letter y. All right, so plug it in, they said here two should be equal to two times one plus one. Well, that is equal, two times one plus one is three, and that is not equal. All right, so that is not true. 
Okay, so let's look at the next one. Again, we're plugging in y. 4 equals 2 times 9 plus 1. Well, 2 times 9 is 18. 18 plus 1, last I checked, is not 4. It's 19 in that case here, so it's not true. Let's look at the next one. D, 22 is equal to 2 times 10 plus 1. Well, 2 times 10 is 20 plus 1 is 21. That's getting closer, but still not correct. Let's hope this last one is correct here, unless we made mistakes. 25 is equal to 2 times 12 plus 1. Well, 2 times 12 is 24, plus 1 is 25. That is true. D is the only one that is a true solution for this equation. Next question. All right, in this one here, we are looking at not only determining linear equations by writing two linear equations here from a word problem, but we're also going to be looking at a system of equations, which is what we're going to really write here. Mary measured the heights of the two different plants every day. Plant A was one inch tall when Mary began her measuring, and it grew at a rate of 0.5 inches per day. Plant B was three inches tall, and it grew at a rate of 0.25 inches per day. On which day were plant A and plant B the same height? All right, a few things that give give away what you're going to do. Number one, when reading, I noticed that I was given an initial starting point, all right? One inch tall when began, that's an initial starting point, and a rate, 0 0.5 inch per day. That means plant A can be written using the equation y equals mx plus b. Anytime you have an initial rate, all right, and a, uh, sorry, an initial starting point and a rate. That means it's slope intercept form, and I can write y equals 0.5x plus 1. All right, plant B gave me the same thing. All right, gave me an initial starting point. In this case, it was 3 inches tall when it began, and it grew 0.25 inches per day. So my rate goes in front of x plus my starting point. Now, that's the first thing that should jump out as to what to do. The second thing tells you what to do with these equations. On which day were plant A and plant B the same height? A system of equations, abbreviated by SOE, is always asking when you've got two situations, when are they going to be the same? So if they're asking for two different situations to be the same, they want you to solve a system of equations. In this case, both of these are set equal to y, so I will use the equal values method. If 0.5x plus 1 is equal to y and 0.25x plus 3 is equal to y, then 0.5x plus 1 must equal 0.25x plus 3. And I'm going to solve this equation. I'm going to get all my x's to one side. And to help me, I'm going to remember that this is really a 0.50. And at the same time, I'm going to move this 1 over there so that I get 0.5x minus 0.25 leaves me with 0.25x because these will cancel out. And on the other side, these cancel out, leaving me with 3 minus 1, which is 2. And if I divide by 0.25 on each side, I find that x is equal to 8. That means that in 8 days, they will be the same. Now, before I come over here and select that as my option B, which is our correct answer, I don't know that it's the correct answer. I want to come back here. And I want to plug it in to make sure that I get the same y in each. And if I come back here and I go 0 0.5 times 8 plus 1, well, half of 8 is 4 plus 1 is 5. Let me check it and make sure in the other equation I should get the exact same thing. All right. One quarter of 8 is 2. 2 plus 3 is 5. Notice I got the same answer in each. That tells me that my answer is correct. Do not just select your answer when you get to x. Go and check it to make sure it works in both equations. All right, next question. All right, we are looking at a compound inequality here given to us in the form of an absolute value inequality. Which graph shows the solution set of the inequality, the absolute value of 2x minus 7, is greater than 3? Well, if this is the case, remember when we have, uh, when we have an absolute value, I'm just going to put uh, the absolute value of 2x minus 7 is equal to 3 for a moment. If I have it equal to 3, we have to ask ourselves, what makes this true? And if I start covering things up here on the inside, I'm asking, what has an absolute value of 3? Well, there's two things that make that true. We all can understand that 3 has an absolute value of 3. 
But not only 3 has an absolute value of 3, but also negative 3 has an absolute value of 3. Therefore, what's inside my absolute value to make this true, all right, if I go back to what was originally inside my absolute value, 2x minus 7, if this equation up here is going to be true, then what was inside this 2x minus 7 needs to either equal 3 or this 2x minus 7 needs to equal negative 3. Either of those would make this equation true at this point. All right, But now I'm dealing with an inequality. And I'm going to apply the same logic here, but I'm going to have two different inequalities. One where 2x minus 7 is greater than 3, where I keep it the same. All right, But I'm going to have a second inequality where 2x minus 7 is going to be negative 3 as the reference point. So therefore, it's the opposite. So I'm going to use the opposite sign. All right, So I'm going to make sure that it is also uh, less than negative 3. All right, so in this case here, now I can solve both inequalities to get my final statement. Add 7 to both sides, 2x is greater than 10, and divide by 2 to find that x is greater than 5. I did not flip my sign because I did not divide by a negative. Same steps over here, but this time I get uh, 4, and divide by 2 on each side to find that x is less than 2. Notice again, I did not flip my inequality sign because I did not divide by a negative. Now, I'm going to identify which of the options up here is the one I'm looking for. First thing I'm going to do is eliminate options that have the wrong reference points. All right, as I look up here, 5 and 2 should be my reference points. A has 5 and 2, B has 5 and 2, C has 5 and, oh, nope, not 2, C's out. All right, D has 5 and, nope, not 2, so that one's out as well. So we know it's got to be A or B. So which way are we shading? In between my reference points or on the outside of my reference points? Well, let's look at 5 first. X is greater than 5. That means it should be going this direction. So I should be going this direction from 5, which is true there. And X is less than 2, so I should be going this direction, less than. Again, this trick only works when X is on the left side. And I should be going this direction, seeing that A is my correct inequality graph. Next question. All right, we're continuing to look at inequalities, but this time we're just looking at a standard inequality. All right, the solution set of an inequality is shown below. Which inequality uh, has the solution set shown on the graph? This is just a tricky way of getting them, uh, getting them to have you, sorry, getting you to do four inequality problems all at the same time. All right, first thing I would do before anything else. I can't really do it in this question, but you might have questions at work, is identify what type of reference point I'm dealing with. This closed circle means I need to be having a greater than or less than in my original inequality. Well, the problem is all four of these are greater than uh, or equal to, less than or equal to, so we can't eliminate our options just yet. All right. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to go ahead and solve each of these. Now, thankfully, these don't take long to solve. I'm just going to start off with A here. All right, if I multiply both sides by a negative 4, all right, that's going to eliminate this negative and 4 over here, all right, resulting in x. But because I multiplied by a negative, I'm going to have less than or equal to, and then negative 4 times a half, which is going to give me positive 2. Right reference point, but wrong direction, because this is less than I want. This result here says x is greater than or equal to 2, because I'm going this way. All right, so it's greater than. All right, so A is wrong. Let's look at the next one. If I do the same thing, multiplying by negative 4 on both sides to eliminate that negative and that 4. This time I multiply by negative again, so I'm going to flip my sign, give me a less than or equal to. And this time it's negative 2, so I know that one is off. Now I'm just multiplying by 4, which is nice, because that seems to be getting me in the right direction, because now I have the correct symbol. I don't need to flip it. I'm not multiplying by a negative. However, negative 1 half times 4 is a negative 2 wrong reference points, which leaves me with my last option here. Multiplying by 4 on both sides does indeed give me x is greater than 2. My answer at that point is d. Let's take a look at our next question. All right, in this question here, it says, a t-shirt company has a goal to earn a monthly profit of more than $3,500. The company charges $20 per t-shirt. The company has $1,500 in monthly costs. 
the inequality 20x minus 1,500 is greater than 3,500 models this situation. Which best describes the meaning of the inequality? Well, before I go any further, I'm just going to read what this inequality says to me. All right, This inequality, 20x, says it's going to be $20 per t-shirt, as they said up top there. In fact, I'm just going to use their own writing. So I'm going to start right here. The company charges $20 per t-shirt minus all right, the company has 1,500 in money, money costs. So minus the monthly costs. And we want that to be greater than, so needs to be greater than 3,000. $500. So they need to be making more than $3,500. That's what this inequality says to me. All right. So let's go ahead and let's look at the options that they have here. The profit made from the sale of, t of 20 t-shirts. Well, no, 20 does not represent the number of t-shirts. So it's automatically putting in a wrong value there. So it's not that one. The profit made from one month of t-shirt sales. Well, no, I mean, I could plug in one month, but that would be if I were to plug in one here. All right. That's what I would see. Uh, if I were to find the profit, which would actually be negative, and that would not make this inequality true either. So it's not what we're talking about when we know we want to describe the meaning of the inequality. We want the meaning of the whole thing, not just what the uh, cost of what the profit of one month is. The number of t-shirts that need to be sold for the company to meet its goal. That is true. That's it right there. Because I need to figure out how this inequality will tell me the value of X that will make this situation true. The value of X needed so that their profits are greater than 3,500. All right, but let's check D, make sure D is false. The number of t-shirts that need to be sold for the company to recover its monthly costs. No, that would be if we had 20X equals 20, oops, 20X equals 1,500. That's what you'd need uh, uh, to figure out if they're equal, how many, but that's, you know, that's gonna not really cover it for you there because the months, it's gonna be crazy. Uh, because you're also going to be doing 20 times 1. So we're not really looking at that either. So we know that D is not it, and we find ourselves that C is the only one that actually describes what the inequality is doing here. All right, let's look at our next question. In our next question, a system of inequalities is shown below. Which graph represents the system? All right, well, the first thing that I would do is I would go ahead and I would simplify this or solve this second inequality so it is all set for Y. All right, in this case here, I'm going to subtract x from each side, giving me 2y is greater than or equal to negative x minus 2. And then I'm going to divide by 2 on both sides. And in this case here, I'm going to find that, I'm going to, that's what this arrow was for, was to show you what I got. There, made the arrow nice. There we go. All right, so I find that y is greater than or equal to negative 1 half x minus 1. All right. So in this case here, I noticed something right away. I noticed that we do have the same slope, so our lines are going to be parallel. I noticed that this one starts at a y-intercept of 3. This one starts at a y-intercept of 1. And shading is beneath the one that starts at 3, but above the one that starts at negative 1. That means shading is going to be in between my two. Uh, pause the video, write down that second inequality if you need it, because we're about to lose it as I slide down to see what our options are. All right, now let's just take a look at our options here. All of our lines are solid graphs, uh, sorry, solid lines, closed lines, so I can't eliminate options based on the type of line. All of my shading is in between, so I can't eliminate it based on the direction of my shading. Uh, so let's look at our slopes. It's negative one half. All right, negative one half says I want negative slopes. Negative slopes meaning that one is out and that one is out. All right, those have positive slopes. So let's take a look down below at our negative slopes, and which ones go through my y-intercept of 3 and negative 1. 3 and, up oh, that one's out right there. It does not go through the correct y-intercept, leaving me with my correct inequality of 3. You could plug this straight into your graphing calculator here, but uh, it could be a little bit challenging to identify the intricacies needed to really figure out which one of these was the correct answer. Next question. 
All right, and this brings us to our open-ended question here for Module 1. Small baskets of tomatoes are sold at a vegetable stand for $3 per basket. Large baskets of tomatoes are sold at the stand for $5 per basket. Only whole numbers of baskets may be purchased. A, cust a customer purchases a total of eight baskets of tomatoes and pays $36. Write and solve a system of equations that models the number of small baskets, X, and the number of large baskets, Y, that a customer purchases. Show or explain your work. In this case here, a customer purchases a total of eight baskets. Total baskets, meaning eight. That means that my small baskets, X, plus my large baskets, Y, has a total of eight baskets all together. All right, and they pay $36. Well, when it's $3 per small basket plus $5 per large basket, I get 36 total dollars. That's my system of equations. Now, in order to find our values of X and Y that make this work, we need to solve it. All right, to solve it, I'm gonna come here and I'm going to use the elimination method because I see I can easily multiply my first equation by negative three in order to get to my result. That gives me a negative 3x minus 3y equals negative 24. And I'm going to combine that with 3x plus 5y equals 36. In order to combine it, I've got to line up my equal signs. This will eliminate my x's because they're the exact opposite. And it gives me a 2y is equal to 12. Finding out that y, therefore, must be 6. All right, we need six baskets. If I know that y is six, I can plug that back into the original to find out what my value of x is. And if I subtract, I find that x equals two, but always double check to make sure it works. If this is the right answer, then three times two plus five times six should be equal to 36. Well, three times two is six, five times six is 30, and that does indeed equal 36. So our answer is true in this case. So when we come back here, we could go ahead and plug in that x was two and that y was six. Again, I'll put my equations here for you so you can see that in case you wanted to pause the video. All right, so that's part one of the question. Now, to show or explain your work, as they're gonna ask you to, I'm not gonna go through and explain all my work because I just did as I talked about it, but in order to show or explain your work here, you need to show each step of what you did and say why you did it. Now you could do that all in words or a combination of math and words. I recommend a combination of math and words because then you cover all your bases, but show each step. Make no assumptions that they know exactly what you're talking about. Assume that they're an idiot and they have no clue what you're doing or why. All right, now take a look at part B. All right, use a system of equations that describes this. Sorry, I read, I'm getting too far ahead of myself. All right, another customer claims that he can purchase a total of 10 baskets of tomatoes and pay $45. Use a system of equations that describes this other customer's purchase to explain why his claim is incorrect. All right, in this case here, this is our new system of equations that would be generated. He's saying that he got a total of 10 baskets, so x plus y equals 10, and got a total of $45. Well, that's the equations that would set this up, and in the same way, I'm gonna multiply this by negative three, to get my new result of negative 3x minus 3y, this time I get negative 30. On the bottom, I'm still gonna have 3x plus 5y equals 45. So it's very much the same, but when I add these equations, I, I find that 2y equals 15. But notice what my value of y is. y is equal in this case to 7.5. That tells me that this is a wrong statement. That tells me that there's no value of y that's a whole number that makes this true, that he got a decimal. He is not able to buy seven and a half large baskets. They're selling them at the store as either small baskets or large baskets. You don't walk into the store, open up a bag of cereal and dump out half of it, walk up to the cashier and just say, I only wanted half of this. So he is not gonna be able to purchase what he's looking for. In this case, he is a liar. All right, let's take a look at the next open-ended question for module one. All right, and in this one here, it says, Tammy and Keith each worked at two part-time jobs in the summer, mowing lawns and raking yards. Tammy earns $10 for each lawn she mows and $5 for each yard she rakes. She wants to earn more than $200 from her part-time jobs. Keith earns $12 for each lawn he mows and $3 for each yard he rakes. He wants to earn more than $180 from his part-time jobs. Write a system of linear inequalities to model the number of lawns they each mow and the number of yards they each rake. All right, so in this case here, uh, let's go for our number of lawns here. Lawns is X 
All right, and yards matches up with Y there. All right, so as we look at this, Tammy earns $10 for each lawn. In other words, $10 per X. So Tammy's gonna get $10 per X, plus she gets $5 for each yard, and so that's $5 for each Y. Uh, so it's just gonna get five Y. And she wants that, she wants to earn more than $200. We want this result to be more than or greater than 200. There's Tammy's inequality. Let's do the next one now, let's do Keith. All right, Keith earns $12 for each lawn, X. So $12, X, plus he earns $3 for each yard, that's Y, so plus three Y. And he wants to earn more than $180. So I want that to be greater than $180. That's our two inequalities that we can write at this point. All right, now they are asking you to write it without using any spaces, so please don't use any spaces. And they're not equal to symbols, all right? It's not greater than or equal to because they just want to get more than uh, those amounts. Let's take a look at the next part. All right. Now, if we continue on, it says, by the end of the summer, Tammy and Keith had mowed the same number of lawns and raked the same number of, uh, raked the same number of yards. Keith had met his goal of earning more than $180, but Tammy did not meet her goal of earning more than $200. What is a possible combination of the number of lawns they could each have mowed and the number of yards they could each have raked? All right, what we're looking at here is we're comparing the two and we're seeing when one is a solution and when one is not. You could just start picking points and random things and try and figure out ones that would make it true for Keith, uh, but not for Tammy, because Keith met his goal, but Tammy did not. All right, but what they really want you to do is they want you to go ahead and graph this system of inequalities, and they want you to use your graphing calculator to do so. I'm gonna pull up my own screen graphing calculator just because it's gonna be a little easier for me to see that and for you to see that on the video, uh, but then I'll talk about how you can do that on your graphing calculator. Now before you can graph it on your graphing calculator, what you're gonna realize is that these are in standard form and the only things you can put into your graphing calculator are things that start with Y. All right, so as I look at this one here, I'm gonna drop my line down. I must solve for Y first. I'm gonna subtract 10X from each side, giving me 5Y is greater than negative 10X plus 200. Notice I put the X term first, so it's in slope intercept form. I'm gonna divide by five on each side. I'm not dividing by a negative, so my sign does not flip, but negative 10 divided by five is negative two X. And then, tw uh, sorry, 200 divided by five is 40. Almost said the answer straight out there. All right, so this is my inequality that you could plug into your graphing calculator. Remember, when you plug it into Y1, it's gonna look like this for you. And you need to come over to the side here where that line is. And if we want a greater than symbol, then I need to change this sign so that the shading is above my line. All right, so you want a symbol like this off to the side when you're graphing that in your graphing calculator. All right, let's try this one now. We're gonna subtract the 12X from each side. All right, divide by three. I am not dividing by negative, so my sign does not change. So I end up with negative four X plus 60. Remember, when you plug that into Y2 for your graphing calculator, you're gonna get something that looks like this. And to get your inequality, come over to this line with your cursor and hit enter until it changes to this symbol. This is the shading above my line. So again, here's my line and we're shading above it. All right, so plug those two into your graphing calculator and see what you get. You should get something that looks like this. All right, now if you notice, I've got nothing. And that's because your standard screen on your graphing calculator is gonna show you a 10 to negative 10, just like this is. But that is not the right spot, all right? I Notice my y-intercepts are at 40 and 60, and I need to zoom this out until I can start to see some of my overlap. My goal is to find my overlapping region. Now, I have to identify which region is a solution region for Tammy and which region is a solution region for Keith. Because if you remember, the problem asked us, it said, I'm gonna read it back to you. It said, Keith had met his goal of earning more than 180, but Tammy did not. That means that I want a point, all right? I want a point where Keith met his goal, but Tammy did not. So I want a point that's shaded blue on my picture, not red, not purple. Purple's where they both met their goal, all right? So for me, this region is right down here. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit, all right? This region here, represents the points 
where Keith met his goal, uh, but can't. But Tammy did not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out all the points in this section that work. Let me just zoom in a little bit. Let me do that. I'm just changing my screen a little bit so you can see it. There you go. All right, you can see my Y values on the left side over here, and you can see my X values down below. So if I just start looking at points, it's got to be whole number points in this case. All right, and I'm going to bring my in just a little bit. That way it's all whole numbers. There we go. Perfect. All right. So I'm looking here, this is 11, and my first one I've got is this point right here. All right, that's 11, 17. All right, that's an option. And 11, 18 is also an option because that is on the dotted line, which means Tammy did not meet her goal. It's on the dotted line. All right, then I'm gonna go to 12. All right, I could go 12, 13, 12, 14, 12, 15, 12, 16, all of those are possibilities. Then go to 13. All right, I've got 13, 9, 13, 10, 13, 11, 13, 12, 13, uh, 13, 13, 14, and so on. And you don't have to pick all of these. You just have to pick one of them. Any point that is in the blue shaded region or in the blue shaded region and on the dotted line for the purple or red for me, um, but not in the shaded region of the purple slash red. All right, so any of these points would work. Any of these would be acceptable. Notice I'm not picking any points that are on the dotted line for blue because dotted line for blue would mean that Keith did not meet his goal. He equaled the amount, but he did not get more than. So any of these points all along here are acceptable. Now I can get down to my zeros. Why would I not go negative there? Well, because we can't have a negative number of lawns raked or we can't have a negative number of, of uh, yards raked or lawns mowed. We can't have negative amounts of those. So any of these points here, 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 and here. Those are all the points that would make this true. If you selected one of those points correctly, then you got a correct full two points for this problem. If not, uh, there were some other points that gave you partial credit. I'm going to put those partial credit ones in green here. Partial credit that they would have given you here was 1020. If you picked that one. They gave you one point because you did pick a, the solution region for both, but it's really a dotted line for both. So it really is not a solution for either, but they're still giving you one point for it. 11, 16. Uh, 11, 16. That point right there where it's not a solution for Keith there. All right, it's not for Tammy, but this is where if you were getting confused on whether or not it is a dotted line or solid line, they give you 12, 12. All right, again, if you got confused on dotted or solid line, they give you any of these points right here. Those points would be partial credit. They give you half credit for it.